So now, the 10 generations from Noach to Avram, and again, and they didn't change. And there's a greater level of culpability for the next 10. The first 10, you'd say, you know, who were they supposed to learn from? But there was enough to understand that God's only going to put up with them only to a point. But the second 10 generations, there's a greater level of liability. Of course, after understanding, you know, you learn from history, your forefathers saw the world destroyed. How do you not behave yourself? So there's even a greater degree of culpability. But God did not destroy the world. Now, why didn't he destroy the world? So he'd say because he made a covenant with existence. He will not destroy the world. That's why. But that's only up to a point. If the Jews wouldn't have accepted the Red Sinai, what did God say? I go back to pre-existence. Existence has a purpose. If that purpose can't be met, a covenant means that there's a chance of recovery. Seemingly, there's no chance of recovery. You people, I destroy the first 10 generations, give you another chance, another 10 generations. Repeated offenders, understanding what God's ability is and to what degree he will not be tolerant. So why, why did you get the message? But they didn't. With a defiance. Avram was born into a pagan world. There was the trace of God in existence. And through his own quest for truth, he came upon, he came upon God. That's Avram of you. But the generation, where are you people? You know, there's an expression, out to lunch. I mean, that's an understatement over here. I mean, literally, they, had, they have the heads buried in sand. I'm pretty deeply buried. And yet they don't get it. And God again, but God does not destroy the world. See, now again, we see how tolerant God is. And the second time, it's even more tolerant than the first time. First time you'd say there wasn't an example of God not being tolerant. But God says 10, and that's it. And you know this. So how do you behave exactly as they? And even worse, again, to, to make it known, how tolerant is he? Until Avram came and he received the, work, the reward for all of them. So here there's an argument. Now, why, why did he destroy them after when Avram came? Noah failed. What was Noah's failing? And what was Avram's success? So Rashi explains here, Birke Avos. What was the objective of the ark? To turn around the generation that they should do tshuva, they should repent. Noah couldn't get them to repent. Rashi says, we read about the souls that were made in Choron. Avram Avinu created a movement. It was called the monotheistic movement. People who were pagans, he was converting mankind in, the, in droves to believe in monotheism. If you look in Rambam, he brought tens of thousands of people. When he went to Canaan, he took a nefesh osum choram. It was a mass movement, monotheism. So because he had that level of impact and that merit, God did not destroy the world. Not destroy the world. And it says, the kibos kulam. And he received reward for, for all of them. Now, you know, there's a question which Nachmanides deals with, until Noah, no one was permitted to eat meat. Mankind was not permitted to eat meat. They all were vegetarians. After the great flood, and up to Noah, up to the world was destroyed. Noah, after the great flood, God says, now mankind is permitted to eat flesh, the flesh of an animal, and to kill for food. So the Ramban asks why. Adam to Noah, they weren't permitted. Now, all of a sudden, 
mankind is permitted to eat meat and to kill for your own personal sustenance. So Rambane explains, during the first ge 10 generations, vegetation was enough. Where do you have a right to kill the animal to sustain yourself? Even though the objective creation is mankind, but it's not necessary. Well, but you know something, it's more nourishing, it's tastier. And it accommodates me where it's more pleasurable. But still, for being more pleasurable, we have no right to take the life of an animal. How do you have a right to take the life of an animal or any living creature? But why did the world continue from Noah going forward? That was the merit of Noah. So Noah could say every creature that work walks the face of the earth exists only because Noah because Noah found favor in the eyes of God. So all existence now is attributed to Noah. Now being attributed to Noah, therefore God says, now you have a right for your own pleasure benefit, you can take the life of the animal. That was the difference in pre-flood and post-flood. Pre-flood, it had nothing to do with mankind, that the existence of the animal. After the flood, everything exists. Whatever was in that ark only exists in the merit of Noah. Therefore, God says, now I allow you to take the life of the animal to benefit and to accommodate your own needs, whatever they may be. That's the difference. Avraham Avinu, the world should have been destroyed. What was it not destroyed? Why did these people do tshuva? Why did they repent? Even the people who became monotheists, only for one reason, because Avram brought them back. So therefore, whatever happened, whatever exists, it's all due to Avram. Therefore, to, to tell us, we, that, and that's why Kibbal Tzharkulam, therefore we received reward for all of them. That's how Rashi learns, because he brought them to the tshuva, so on forth. Therefore, he, was, he had a degree of merit that he received the reward for all of them. Rabbi Noyon learns differently. I'll give you an example. A person runs a business. And when originally he starts a business, he understands he has to have a minimal profit margin, but definitely not a loss. And even if a loss, you continue to swallow the loss because you hope someday there'll be a profit. Initially, you have to invest, investment capital till you make profit. It takes a while. And sometimes you take losses, but ultimately it's good, you're going to have a profit. Well, what about if it's a lost cause? It's only good money after bad money. And there's no light at the end of the tunnel. What do you do? Close the business now. Now, the, God says, it's worth for me to maintain this existence if within 10 generations I could see some return on my capital, my spiritual capital. If not, I pull the plug. I will create a new existence. And that started from Noah going forward. So the world had to achieve a minimal level of value, spiritually speaking. Noah couldn't bring the people back. But in, in terms of the dimension of Noah's own personal spirituality, he didn't meet the minimum profit quotient. And therefore, God says, I have to destroy the world. Avram Avinu, as a dimension of person, Avram, although the people failed, and he, even though he brought people back to do tshuva, it wasn't enough. But he, in his own right, was able to cover the base for all mankind for 10 generations. What he achieved in his own life was the equivalent of what they were supposed to accomplish in 10 generations. So because he met minimally, the minimum requirement, why it's worthwhile to maintain existence, that's why God didn't destroy existence. And that's why it's Kibbal Tzachar Kinegat Kulam. The reason why Avram was, was deserving of all the reward of those 10 generations, because what they failed and they didn't do, he picked up the slack and he achieved that, and that's why God didn't destroy the world for that reason. This is how Rabbi Niona explains it. It's like a person comes in, a company's about to be bankrupt, go bankrupt, and this person has capital, and he picks up the company for five cents on a dollar. And the creditors say, you know something? We're willing to forego our claims. He has the whole company. But if he, of course, he wouldn't have given five cents on a dollar, it would have been over. They would have closed shop. 
But because this man came and saved the day with that infusion and paying off the debt, even though that, it's all yours. Avram saved the day because he was able to meet a minimum requirement of value for existence. Therefore, why does existence exist now? What they were meant to accomplish, you accomplished. Therefore, everything's a credit to your account. That's how Rabbi Yonah explains it in his commentary. It was a famous word from Rav Aaron Kotler, Zechat Sarek Levrocho, that, you know, in the yeshiva world, Friday is probably the day that the least about the Torah studied. Why? Because people are busy doing other things, preparing for Shabbos, whatever it is. So let's say a person would go, and despite other levels of responsibility, he takes out time to study at that time with the less people studying. Because the less people studying, every day God wants a minimum amount of Torah to be studied. And let's say it's faltering. It's not where it should be. And by you studying that extra time, that extra time you study on Friday, that same time during the week, it wouldn't have the same value. But because today, that infusion of that Torah study, it contributes to another level of value. Therefore, as deserving wise, you're more deserving. Because the return on your, on your infusion, your, your level of accomplishments is much more far reaching because the less people studying. And while I'm speaking, I'm thinking, you know, the, Talmud, the Rambam rules in the laws of Talmud Torah, that if a person has a, cha- a choice to study during the daytime, nighttime, he should study at the nighttime. If you have a choice. And he cites a verse in Echo, which was written by Jeremiah the prophet. It says, Kumi roni balaylo. Rise and sing out at night. And what's Rina? Rina's song. Ain't Rina and the Torah. And Yirmiya, the prophet says, at the time of destruction of the Besamigdosh, Kumi Roni Belai, rise and sing out at night. And what is the song of the Jew Torah? So if a Jew has the choice, day or night, you should study at nighttime. Now, why nighttime? Why is the night so special? So I, I, there are multiple ways you could understand. But as I'm speaking... Most people are sleeping at night. So if Torah is being studied, there's less Torah studied at nighttime during the daytime. So therefore, by you choosing the night where there's less being studied, that means your contribution, which Torah is the ultimate contribution, has greater value. Therefore, if you have a choice to study day or night, and it is within your choice, and you could study at night, but you're, it's not both. One or the other, nighttime, you get a greater return on your, on your investment. Because factually, the value of that infusion into spirituality contributes to a greater degree. Therefore, that's why it's a better, that, that's why it's a better choice the night time period rather than daytime period. Talmud tells us, why did God create night? What's the value of night? God could have created man, he doesn't have to sleep, right? That would have been interesting. What would all the mattress companies do, right? And all the, you know, all the pharmaceuticals. The, the whole issue of insomnia would have been an issue. Insomnia is only an issue because he's supposed to sleep and the person needs to sleep. So why does a person, why, why did God create night? The Chobos of God says a question, why did God create a human being with the need to do bodily functions. He could have created the person that he never has to do bodily functions. And if he has to do, once every six months. Why? What's the reason? So he explains the Chovos Levovos. You know, we know that the Rambam writes that any characteristic we have, you should not take it to the extreme. This is what we call the golden path. The golden path, it's called Shvil Hazov, is the equidistant location for both extremes. But yet, when he speaks about humility, we read in Pirkei Avos, Havi Ma'od Ma'od Shval Ruach. Comes to humility, you have to take it to the nth degree. 
Why? Because a human being is naturally self-centered and unless you suppress it continuously to the nth degree, it, it reinflates immediately. So there's an ongoing level of suppression which is needed to be humble. Otherwise, you can't deal with it. Otherwise, you become consumed with your ego and you write your own script. And what's right, what you believe is right. You know, might is right. That's what it's all about. So why did God create a person with the need to his bodily functions? A person says, you know, an animal doesn't have, need, needs to do its bodily functions. And it's something which is earthy and something you, would, you don't want to witness it. You know something? You share a certain characteristic with the animal. The animal has to defecate and urinate and release these secretions. You know something? You have the same. You have something very much in common with the animal. Having that need and knowing that, that is in the, that something is to humble you. Know that you know you have to, you're, you're no different than the animal. And therefore, evidently, your claim to fame is not your physicality, because within your physicality, you share many characteristics that the animal has. That's why God created the human being with the need to do his bodily functions for that reason, to put a little a lid on that, that, on that pompousness that the person should focus on that and become more humble and understand who he's not. That's the Masilsa Sharim. Why did God create night? Because it says, Lo Ivri, Leila Elo, Legirso. God created nighttime to study Torah. If a person would have enough energy and wouldn't have to sleep, a person would work 24 hours a day. So, but God created the world to study Torah. That's the objective. The material is only to facilitate the spiritual. But if a person is able to work 24 hours a day and he's not fatigued and he doesn't have to sleep, what happens to Torah? As they say, you miss the boat. You don't even realize the boat's in the harbor. It's not only you miss the boat, you don't see the boat. Therefore, when comes nighttime, physically, humanly, you're forced to, see, to cease that activity. And as a result of that, what are you going to do with the nighttime? You can't remain in the field. Once nightfall comes, she would say, well, he's so fatigued. He'll eat and go to sleep. Okay, so that now there's a challenge. Do you go to sleep or do you set aside some time to study Torah? Or during the daytime, you're preoccupied. I have to be responsible. I got patients to see in the office. Other guy person says, you know, the market closes at four. And after four, I got to tally up, you know, my clients and my commissions. That I got to do that. And at nighttime, you know, I have to show my wife to what degree I'm successful. We got to go up to that restaurant. Then we have to go to a show. And then afterwards on the way home, you know, you got to pay your limousine driver. And then by the time you finish, you're waking up for the next morning. So there's not much time. And, you know, you pay $50,000 for that bedroom set. You got to be in that bed to, to benefit from it. So before you turn around, 70 has passed like a blink of an eye. It's checkout time. Okay. So what do you have to show for your life? So God says, you know, the nighttime, a man, a person can, is not as productive at nighttime because the body clock, you know, it's very interesting. You know, the Talmud tells us, and halakhali it has a bearing on it, that the menstrual cycle of a woman is affected by the sun. By sunrise, although dawn is day, but in terms of menstrual cycle of a woman, She's affected its sunrise. Of course, the rising, the setting of the sun has to do with the body clock of a woman. But just as today we know there's a, a woman has a has the cycle is affected by the solar system, a man, a, a male also has, has a, a body clock. And at certain times during the month that people are more accident prone, they're less focused. And this has to do with, with the clock. At the day of the month, it has to do with the sun, all these different things. We're also affected by this. So therefore, a person at night naturally gets tired. Naturally gets tired. We're more alert during the daytime. The sun has relevance to it. Daylight has relevance to this. What do you think in, 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 in Russia? What do you think they have an issue with you know, alcoholism? They drink amounts that we can't even relate to how much they drink there. Because when winter sets in, it's depressing, it's dark, it's, it's ominous. And what do you do? How do you deal with that? People become depressed. 
What does a person who's David says, what does a Mori Nefesh do? You hit the bottle. You become intoxicated. You drown your sorrows. We drink. That's why all these countries that have less light in the winter, therefore, there's a greater degree of alcoholism for that reason. For that reason. Because again, the sun is crucial to activate your system to be up, a sense of wanting to be productive. So nighttime, because it's the less people studying, the world is less functioning at night. So if you take that time and you utilize it for Torah study and the world exists or a, a very significant part of existence is due to your infusion, the value at nighttime is greater than the value during the daytime for that reason. Avram Avinu, because he picked up the slack and he was able to accomplish what the 10 generations were supposed to accomplish, and he accomplished it, as Rabbi Niona, therefore, it's Kibbal Schar Keneget Kulam. He received reward for all of them. Chavetz Chaim writes in one location that the Gemara tells us that the Tzaddik he receives his share in the world to come and he receives the portion of the evil one that he was supposed to get, which he didn't take, that he didn't take advantage of. So Chavetz Chaim asks, why? What, is, what does the tzaddik have to do with the evil person's share in the world to come that he could have had if he would have made the right choice? So he explains that speaking about this. A person is devoutly righteous. He lives in the community. And being who he is, he tries to influence people to have a correct perspective. So what does the evil person do? He gives the tzaddik a hard time. Whatever the tzaddik is trying to accomplish, he's trying to, he, the Russia, the evil person, discredits the tzaddik. The man is a caveman, archaic, provincial. You know, he's not living with reality. So whatever the tzaddik tries to do positive, he's ridiculed. The tzaddik is ridiculed and denigrated and discriminated. And whatever he can, he does. Despite all that, the tzaddik's not discouraged. So therefore, the Russia, rather than take advantage of what's opportunity for him, he goes and he tries to destroy the tzaddik. We're not talking about the tzaddik receives a portion of the Russia that has no relevance to him. We're speaking it's in the same community. So despite that, because he tolerated this man's behavior, and despite that, he succeeded to maintain himself and he did it in any way. He wasn't compromised. Therefore, he receives his portion of the world to come. That's how Chavetz Chaim explains that, that passage in the Talmud. But Avraham Avinu is much more than that, as we're saying. Of course, he was ridiculed. We find one of the 10 tests, he was in the cave for 13 years. Avraham Avinu was a pariah, was a fugitive. They wanted to kill him for proselytizing, monotheism. He's trying to under, undermine the pagan system. All of a sudden, he's introducing a new belief in the world. I mean, Lahavdil Elif Abdolis, Elif Abdolis, the friendship between what's profane and holy, when Christianity came originally was, was, was introduced, what did the Romans do? Right? They threw these people to the lions. That's what they did when they put them in, 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 a, in an arena with, with a gladiator. They, they pulverized them. When anybody wants to try to undermine the system, there's a vicious, violent reaction. Lahavdim, Avram Avinu was introducing something. As we say, he was born in a pagan world. He's born in a world that's so dark, they don't even know what light means. All of a sudden, he's shedding light on things, and he causes everything that believes to be shattered. You know what that means? You build something for centuries or millennia, and also you come and say, you know, you people, you're mistaken. You know what it means to admit that you lived a lie all these years? Person doesn't back down. He'll do whatever he can to destroy that person who's trying to cause him his credibility and his value should be, should be questioned. Many years ago, person wanted to study with someone, he, he was interested. And then he started to realize, and he was a Jew, 
that he, that he was getting having an interest. He says, I have to stop the session. Of course, factually, I continue to go further with this. Ultimately, I'm going to have to divorce my wife because my wife is not coming along with this. My children will not accept it. Therefore, it's a question of my wife or my children. I'm not going, I'm not, I can't go beyond this. Of course, it's too much of a sacrifice. I can't make that sacrifice. We're talking about he understands the value and it's correct. But because to relieve you, release yourself from your life now and give up what you have, what you love and you value, it's too painful. It's too costly. Although he knows it's the right decision. But, you know, human beings are not pure intellect. We're emotional, physical beings. And we have allegiance. We're loyal to the people we love. And we don't want to hurt those people. And if they don't understand what, what you understand, you're not willing to go there. We read about the Ben Sora Mora in the Torah, the rebellious child. Torah says that if you're a child between 30 and 33 months, he goes and he steals from his parents and he buys wine and meat, and which is gluttonous behavior. And the parents report this to the Besden, to the rabbinic court. They go and they flog him. They give him lashes. And he becomes a repeated offender. He steals again, does the same thing over again. They put him to death. So the Talmud says, in reality, it never, ever happened. Because to meet all the criteria of this, but what's the conception, what's it, what's it all about? Because if a parent sees a child developing an addiction, and that addiction will eventually cause him to become a murderer, a highwayman, and become a murderer, better take him out now when he's not as culpable to let him to go to a life of crime where he's going to victimize and take many lives. That's what the parents should do. What happens if they don't do it? Ultimately, he's going to be convicted and put to death as a murderer, as a highwayman. So it's never, never happened. So if that's if it never happened, the Talmud asks, if that's the case, why write it in the Torah? Right? So the Talmud says to study it and to draw a lesson. So all the commentators says, what lesson are we what's the lesson we're supposed to draw from there? So the Rabbi Bachi cites another uh, commentary who says, commentator, the lesson is. Who ever heard of a parent taking a child to be put to death? A parent always, because of the love for the child, always tries to rationalize and justify and attribute it to its immaturity. It's only 13 years old. See, stole. You brush it under the carpet. Rather than recognizing ultimately what this could bring, could bring, the parent's love for the child surpasses that reality and the parent doesn't want to be in touch with reality. What's being touched, the parent understands the cost factor that the child's life is going to be taken. So what happens if the child parent brushes it under the carpet? Ultimately, the Torah says what's going to be because that child is being reared in a way that he's developing an addiction. Ultimately, he's going to be put to death because he's going to become a murderer. He's going to become a gangster. That's what's going to happen. So what's the takeaway? The takeaway is that if the love for, for, of the parent for God would have been great and love for himself, they would have been able to deal with it. But because the love for that child is greater than the love for God, they couldn't. So what is that? It's the equivalent of the Al-Qaeda. Avram didn't have a child till he was, he was 100 years old. At the age of 100, he finally had that special child, Yitzhak. At the age of 37, God says to him, take your child and bring him up as, as a burnt offering. Avram didn't hesitate. It's unheard of. And the Torah says, the child that was born to you in your old age, who you love, and so on, and he was special. I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that? It's something which emotionally, mentally is not survivable. Avram, because Avram's love for God was greater than his love for his child and for himself. That's the reason. That's the takeaway. So what do we? what's the perspective? Nobody expects anybody to be on Avram Avinu. But we expect, we have to work on a perspective to understand who God is and what God does for us and what the ultimate value of existence is, that we have to understand that God has to be seen very special. And his will is the priority in the Jew's life. And that's why in the first paragraph of the Shema, we spell to what degree do you have to love God? 
Firstly, you have to demonstrate that love even to give your life at times. You have to give your life. If you give an ultimatum, kill or be killed, you're not permitted to commit murder. You're not even to save your life. To do idolatry, you're not permitted. To commit adultery incense, you're not permitted. Homo dejo. What about they'll confiscate every you all, everything you own? You'll be stripped of every level of material. You're not permitted. And with all your heart, you have to fully. That's the level God expects, and that's the ultimate. And if you do that and you demonstrate that, then you've succeeded. So again, everything in life is what is priorities. The more you appreciate something's innate value, it makes it easier for it to be a priority. People understand earning a living is a priority. You're responsible to your family, put, put food on the table, that's understood. Put a roof over that, that's understood. Clothe them, that's understood. What about they should live in a, in a state of affluence? Is that a priority? What about in the state of opulence? Is that a priority? Everything becomes a priority. But if you pit that against your own Judaism, you know, a person says, you know, I have no choice. I have to go to work. I don't have the time to study. He doesn't, okay? Studies a little bit. Even a few minutes a day, it's something. What about the person says, thank God he lives in a secure environment. He puts food on the table. But you know something? I think I'm ready to upgrade. Now my mortgage is 5000 a year. I think I could, I could, I could afford a... a $500,000 mortgage a year. You're not going to buy a state out in Westchester. I think I can afford it. I'll have a menagerie in my backyard. You know, just a zookeeper is, is, is a fortune. My gardener, half a million dollars a year just for the gardener. Could you imagine? But I can afford it. Yeah, but what are you giving up for that? You can afford it. Uh, on whose tab are you? When you? But it's on God's tab. You know something? You can't go on God's tab. You got to be on your own tab. You have no choice is one thing. But if your decision is compromising on something that you should do and be more responsible, then, then there's liability. Then there's reckoning over there. So again, everything's perspective. Priorities, understanding what the innate value of opportunity is and what you're giving up for what. And that's Avram Avinu, understanding what the priority is and what the innate value of existence is, he was able to pick up the slack where the 10 generations had failed and therefore, he was meritorious for all of them, and the world continued to exist, to be continued. Okay, everybody be well. And tomorrow we'll be back in the Saturday. Uh, 11 o'clock is Duffy Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Take care. Good to see everybody. Thank you.
Larry, how are you? How did you how did how'd you enjoy it? I loved it, but you know it is a different feel, this one. Because I might come my notes on, on this one was fascinating. I started out really mesmerized based on some of the mysteriousness, and I was gonna ask you whether it has a touch of Kabbalistic No question. Yeah, it was fascinating. And if that's what the Kabbalah is anything like, it was spectacular. But I wanted to say that the last, I wrote a note, the last 10 minutes of your lecture had a complete beginning, middle, and end. There was a theme there. And in the beginning, I wasn't knowing how you were going to tie up what you were saying, if you know what I mean. I, I, you understand, I think. What I'm saying. Yeah. There was, a, there, was a, there was a certain level of, it was, it was a randomness throughout much of it in my mind. That's not negative. It just was a train of randomness, although the generations pulled it together. But at the end, there was, in my mind, a message there, the message there. And that was very compelling. So I, it was different. And that's what I wrote in the bottom here. Was there a theme to this entire lecture in general? Or was there really a theme? There is a theme. The 10, which is a unit, that is the theme. That okay. not, not, nothing's random. Everything has a purpose and it all fits. And the profile of the way all pieces fit together, the message is loud and clear, what, what the objective is. Uh, yeah, I thought it was spectacular. No, but I'm saying that is that is what it, that's what it was all about. The ten, the number ten, that's what it's all about. That was yeah. Because ten, was ten is a unit. That means every one of every component contributes to that to that ten. Yeah, no, but I got. But no, no, but that's that's we're going all all the way down the pike with the same idea. Okay, okay. Well, no, but you know, you see, you got to a place where there was pre-flood, after flood, there was talk about meat. I, I thought you were going to have humor in there when you said bodily functions. Well, what's the point? Well, if there were no bodily functions, there wouldn't be a Costco. No, see, that's your kind of, I, that, that's not my kind of humor. No, no, no. I know, I know. I know, look, you, you know, plumbers wouldn't be, wouldn't be rich people. What am I supposed to tell you? That's right. <laughs> you know, and you know, could you imagine the guy who wears a 56 waist dungarees? If he wouldn't do his bodily functions, the guy would expand to who knows where. Explode. It's wonderful. Exactly. No, no, but no, but, but it was it was mesmerizing. I mean, look, it, you know, it's interesting. It it, it, it was me- sometimes it's not you know, I say not as much. This was compelling. The, the, the notion of the generations of Noah of the story and so on, it, it's compelling. I mean, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. Beautiful. Too bad you didn't press the record button quickly. for the first half an hour. Yeah, I know. And real, but okay, a little bit. I have, I have. No, but you see, I call you not. I, I want your feedback because you know, if I know, if I touch you, and not not with the with the cute comments or you know the references, no, I, 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 it's to see how you process that message. Oh yeah. Well, look, I some of it. By the way, I'm going to admit some of it. I have to force myself. It's the HRO working because. You know, your last message about, you know, a person recognizing what he has to do, but cannot possibly, you know, sacrifices, I want to say family, wife, whatever, to that extent. That's a tough choice. That's no a, question. Very, very no very question. Thing. No true. question. You know, you know, when I mentioned that $500,000 for just the gardener. No, yeah, I do. no, no, no. Michael shared that with me. Michael himself told me, I'm going back now uh, a good 20 years ago. That. <laughs> That's what he pays just for his garden, the 500000 a year. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. You know, candidly, I wouldn't even want the opportunity to have that choice, frankly. Because the, the, imagine the amount of responsibility that goes with the wall of ashes. So, I always say, you know, I ran it. I ran it. He's very close with me. I'm very close with him. Yeah. You know, do you know what just to maintain his property is? Oh, I can't imagine. You, you can't imagine how, how it's, it's like a city there. Roads, sure. lighting, sure. electricity. To be for his children when they're someday after 120, you're going to inherit that. Yeah. Do you think they're going to want to underwrite that? <laughs> no, I'm just even if they're able to, why would they want it? Why would they, the cost? And that's why you know uh, the Rockefellers, the Roos, they gave they 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 donated to the government to the to the country, and they got a tax write-off on it. Sure. 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 Did you 
noticed that they did this as a matter of commentary with these guys who don't pay taxes just to, to say this. When they, when they take, what they do is they borrow on their assets. This is what they do, Carl Icahn and all these people. They borrow on their assets, and then the interest on the note, they give themselves corporate salaries in that exact amount so that they can write off the interest and then pay no tax. Think about it. I mean, just an interesting comment. That's what they do. So they don't even pay tax on their corporate salaries. Yeah. It's, just, it's remarkable. It's an interesting thing to have a sense of business, what they do. I didn't know that. But it was quite amazing to me. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, it was a wonderful lecture, Rob. I really do. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks for Oh, you be well. I'll take care. Enjoy the day. You, you too, Coach. Hello. Yes, Rabbi Kolatsky. Oh, yeah, one second. Good morning. My wife. Hello. Yes, Rabbi Kolatsky speak. I don't know. Hi, who, how are you? Who am I? I know I am, right? I don't know you who. Do I don't know who you are. Yes. yes. Okay. So, um, so you know, do you know that I have a uh, um, you know that I have, I have a sister. She's thirty-seven. She's she's a presser. She could do anything. No, I know you and your sister look alike, right? I remember when you were when I first moved to Muncie, you were little girls. So I was a little girl. I got married when we moved to Muncie. So I'm not that. Yeah, old. but I, I but I was there I'm before. Later. Yeah, okay. No, I'm just saying, I, I you know, but I was 20 when we moved. Oh, you're there? Okay, because I lived there uh, 30, I lived, it's about 38 years since I moved to Muncie, 38 years right. ago. Right, okay. so, my, so my father grew up in Muncie. Yeah, he right. Moved, he moved to Muncie in 51. Right. And then he, after, when I was four in 1970, when I was three, my, my parents moved to Muncie. Right, married. right. So, so, um, so we lived in on Renfin and Hardy. Right, and then right, right. Extend half, and then they said, oh, we might as well live in a na younger neighborhood because we have younger children. So right. I'm already, you know, almost out of half my, or some of my brothers. But but I have two, two darker sisters who are, you know, who are more, look more like. Anyway, so this is the young one of those two, but, I'm, you know, my, okay. I, okay. my youngest brother is 30. So, we'll, so tell me about this, Bahar. I'll tell I don't, I have to, I have to speak to my wife who she's speaking about. I have okay. to, who's 30 years old. That you learn with three times a week? And I don't know. But he's not 30. That person's in his 50s. That's firstly. Oh. He's, he's, okay. er, he's 50 years old. Secondly, okay, he's about Shuvah. And okay. uh, uh, I don't think it, you know, the way I see oh, you, okay. your sister. He's 35. Okay. No, maybe no. to somebody else. She may be speaking about someone else that I'm not aware of. Okay. If, if, Perfect. Unless, okay. She, of course, it came from Sheila Schwabel. And Sheila Schwab may, may have not heard accurately what my wife said. So either my, there is such a person, and yeah. I'll, I'll ask my wife. I, the truth is, my wife's out of town right now. I just finished the year two minutes ago. I was going to wow. call her and ask her who that person is that when okay. I do speak to you, I, I have to I have okay. to look into it. I don't know. Okay. Okay. So let me, let, so let me just give you a cut. You have two minutes? But let me tell you something. My daughter, I have daughter Rachelea Ginsburg. She lives yeah. in, in Lakewood. And yeah. she, lately she's gotten involved in Shidduchim and she's really bent to try to make Shidduchim. And I think it's worthwhile to speak to her. Okay. And uh, she's leaving no stone on her and to try to help people like your sister or people like that, or even younger okay. people. Uh, yeah. She's married to, uh, her married name is Ginsburg. I, okay. I don't know, I don't know if you remember my daughter. Uh, uh, I really don't remember any of the kids because I moved, I got married a year later and I like, never got to, but it was so funny because People at the table were like, "Oh, you, you should have heard Rabbi Kolatsky speak." I said, "I heard Rabbi Kolatsky speak many, many times. I believe you. That it was amazing. I believe you." Were you at the Shevet Brachos? I was at the Brachos by day. Oh, by day. What? Were, what is your married name? What, what? I'm a con. I'm a sister-in-law. Yeah, I know. I, I think I know your your husband came in later. Yeah, my husband came in later to check up. Yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember when you were married. I remember when he married yeah, you. Yeah. I'm sure you do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. The first time we made in the house. Let me, let me just, I'm just throwing one more thing at you because, because I know that you had, you had a down to the trial and everything. I have, I have a brother who's really, uh, he's just delayed. He's 30. I know he, he has, uh, what, what's, uh, he, he doesn't have a diagnosis. He's more like an Asperger's. Asperger. Yeah. I know, I know, you, I know not, your brother. I know, I know. Okay. He, he, we really need to marry him off. He keeps saying to me, 
Well, you know, well, let me tell you something. There's a person yeah. whose name is Yoel Jacobowitz. He's a doctor in Baltimore. He's the, yeah. he's, he lives on Yeshiva Lane. I know. My brother knows. And, and his, he, has a bro, he has a child. His oldest child's into the Chemia. He has yeah. a similar condition to your brother. I mean, today yeah, he's, married. he's married, he has children, and uh, he married a girl who was a little slower. They have a beautiful right. family. Every child is normal and special, and especially right. in, in a good way. And uh, it may be pay, pay for you to speak to him exactly how okay. they came about. His name is Dr. Jacobitz. His father was the chief rabbi of, of England. We know, we know him. He, he takes care of the Newburgers. I mean, you know, okay, so he, right. So, so his his so his oldest child is right. similar to your to your brother. Okay. Yeah. You, uh, you don't have any other. You don't have any other community leads to for your brother. To, to your brother. Well, You know something? I can ask, you know, there was somebody, it was uh, a Nevinetsky from Lower East Side. There was, yeah. and you know, he lives, to, he, he's a race curl here in, what's his name? In uh, Flatbush. He had a son at the yeah. age of nine. He, no, he, he didn't get married. He, he got married. He got, no, 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 he got married yeah. right now. He married he a girl. Recently. He married a girl who she herself was in Hask. But her issue wasn't, she's a very smart girl. She had certain issues. And, wow. and they married. They married, I'd say, uh, within six, six months. They're right. happy. They have somebody supervising them a little bit. Right. They need it. Right. But yeah. he he was a normal child. He was in a car accident at the age of nine. He was slightly brain damaged. So he was wow. a little slow. But for her, she's the happiest person in the world. Perfect. So Whoa. I'm just saying. So again, uh, yeah. you have to be in touch with these kinds of people. Right. Okay. Right. I really appreciate Okay, I'll speak to no my problem. wife. I have your number. I'll, I'll get back okay, to you. Okay, she can call me directly. Um, yes. I'm friendly. I, you know what I'm saying? If you don't have time to get back to me, she gets back to me. Yes, me. yes, fine. yes. I heard she's amazing. So I'm very happy for you that you have an amazing wife. And Baruch Hashem. I mean, you too. And uh, again. Okay, thanks a million. Thanks for calling me back. Okay, you cultive. Hatzlacha. Cultive.